We had two questionable decisions, one absolutely god-awful decision, and then a no contest in the co-main event. UFC Vegas 88 was officially a dumpster fire. My name is Angelo, this is We Want Picks, and I'm going to break down the chaos that was UFC Vegas 88. Before I talk about the fights, let me talk about the bets. The difference between me making money tonight and me losing money was that Brian Battle no contest. This spreadsheet here is every single bet I put on the board. You can see the Brian Battle and Tiago Moises parlay. Well, obviously that broke and it turned just into a Tiago Moises money line. His minus 425 odds were not enough to drag me into the green. I ended up losing $62 on this card. A unit for me is $100, so I lost 0.62 units officially, 0.6147. This is every single bet I had on the board. I hit the over on the Nunez Chandler fight. And that was the sketchy one. The safety parlay broke because the over on the Kanzad and Chasson fight didn't hit. It ended up breaking a second time for the first time in history for me when Kennedy and Chuck Wu also lost. I have never had the base of a safety parlay both legs loose. That has never happened before, but it did. There's, oh, hey, there's always a first time for everything. What a disaster. And we'll talk about those fights specifically. Jacob did hit his underdog lock of the week in Danny Silva at plus 170. We did have the best DraftKings ownership projections in the game. So if you're here for the fantasy aspect of things, uh, hopefully you had a good night. And the only thing that kept Jacob from making a good amount of money was that Isaac Dolgarian decision. He was pretty extended there with 2.6 units on Isaac. Let's go ahead and talk about the fights specifically. Tiago Moises looked good. And he was supposed to look good. A, he was a giant favorite. B, he had a short notice opponent. Couple of takeaways though. His opponent was tremendous. Mitch Ramirez was absolutely humongous next to Tiago Moises. I, I, they don't look like they were in the same weight class. The other takeaway, I'm gonna say three. I said two, we're going to three. It looks like Tiago's got some staff on his arm, and I saw that early in the fight. And then after the Benoit Saint Denis staff controversy, I was like, "Oh man, watch Moises get smoked, get exhausted in the second round. Something bad happened because he's tired, because of antibiotics and whatever other excuses they come up with." But luckily, that didn't happen. Tiago Moises was composed. Tiago Moises was put together. He was able to get the takedowns whenever he wanted to. They looked very good. He was able to control on top, and he won this fight. He looked good the whole time. But my question is, when is calm too calm? If you rewatch that fight, at first it's like, wow, Tiago is just completely unrattled. Looks good. He's composed. This, I mean, he looks so dialed in. And then the longer it went, it's like, this guy doesn't look like he cares. Like, he's going through the motions, but he's just like, mm, okay, well, all right, take down. Oh, well, I'm good at jiu-jitsu. Here's a bunch of control. So obviously he won, and it's not a concern for this fight. But if he's fighting somebody where he needs to step it up and he needs to dog it out, it might be tricky. And what was funny is DC, when Mitch Ramirez moved forward for a few seconds there, he had a little, uh, just a sliver of success. And uh, sorry, not DC. And Michael Bisping said... Well, that's how you beat Tiago Moises. You can break him. It's almost like they recognize, eh, Tiago Moises does have some quit in him. And I could see that. Seeing his composure, he's almost too calm. He doesn't seem like he's willing to just go to war and dig it out. Either way, he looked great. He should have been in the safety parlay with uh, friggin' Mike. We'll talk about that in a minute. Poor Corey McKenna. Took a year off, got married, Dealt with a few things it sounded like. She was pretty private about all that, but had a wonderful year. Got married the love of her life, settled in, and then came out here only to catch a kick, get a takedown in the first 30 seconds, and then get submitted. And that sucks. And I'm very glad I didn't bet on this fight. When it was minus 101 or whatever it was, and Corey McKenna was the ever so slight favorite, the dog at one point, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, I was like, man, Corey McKenna can win this fight. She's good. She's basically better everywhere except the ground. But I don't know if I can trust her not to shoot. And that was Jacob's breakdown as well. If you watched our breakdown video, Jacob's breakdown was Corey McKenna should win. But I am pickling, jacking, I am pickling. Jacob pickles now. Him and Miranda Maverick. 
I am picking Jacqueline Amorim because her jiu-jitsu is just so good and she can pressure forward. And if she gets it to the ground, that's the end of this fight. And that's exactly what happened. Corey McKenna could not help herself. And that's what happens with some of these team alpha male fighters. Even Song Yudong, phenomenal striker, can't help himself but shoot. And it's incredible to have that skill set, to be able to lean on it. But you also need to know the situation you're in. And catching a kick, fine. But then using that to get it to the ground with a no-gi jiu-jitsu world champion grappler, with a gi jiu-jitsu world champion grappler, to give her the only possible opportunity she had to win this fight was by submission, to, to go into that world... It just, it sucks. And I get it. That's a, it's a split second decision that she made and she's going to regret it for a very, very long time. And that absolutely sucks. And I'm not trying to pile on here, but that was the story of this fight. Jacqueline Morham has such insane jujitsu that the very second she was on the ground, Corey McKenna was in trouble instantly. And not only did she submit Corey McKenna once, she submitted her twice. If you didn't see the fight, Jacqueline Amorim had Corey McKenna basically full-blown armbar submitted. And the referee goes, stop. Yelled, the ref yelled, stop. And Jacqueline, I hate saying Jacqueline. I just want to say Jacqueline. Jacqueline let go of the armbar. Not fully, but like, you know, let go. Wasn't like, ooh, but she let go. And then Corey yells, no, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine. I didn't tap. And so the ref is like, ooh, okay, continue. It was ridiculous. Continue. And then luckily for the referee, Jacqueline Amorim just snatched it back up and, what, 10 seconds later had that arm bent in the wrong direction again and got the submission. The reason I say luckily for the referee is let's say she didn't get that arm bar back and Corey McKenna was on top and pounded away and won or stood all the way up and now that position is completely gone and then Corey goes on to win the fight. Well, that referee directly interfered and because of that referee's actions, it completely changed the outcome of the fight. The butterfly effect. That small decision changed the outcome of the fight. Luckily, in this case, it didn't change the outcome. She submitted her, let go. Oh, oh, we're back on. And then submitted her again just a few seconds later. But it sucks for Corey McKenna. I'm glad I did not bet on her. I almost did. I was very close to betting on her, and I'm glad I didn't. But I do know a lot of people did. That line moved. That line moved. She turned into a like, good-sized favorite. Nothing crazy, but a good-sized favorite by the time that fight closed. The lock of the week is back. The lock of the week's not my thing. It's Jacob's thing. If you don't know what it is, Jacob, my uh, partner in crime, the little, little red leprechaun boy, Jacob picks an underdog every single week. So somebody who's supposed to lose and says, this is my lock of the week. This person will win. It's always an underdog. This week, he picked Danny Silva. He was on a bit of a losing streak there. He picked Danny Silva. People dogged him a little bit. And you know what? In the first 30 seconds of that fight, I was like, wow, Danny Silva's got this locked up. He dropped Josh Coulibau with, like, the third punch he threw. It was like jab, straight left, uppercut, boom, dropped Coulibau. I don't remember what the combination was, but he dropped Coulibau with an uppercut. Immediately takes his back, tried to work in a couple of different chokes, tried to make something happen. Looked incredible. Looked incredible early. Dropped him again just a little while later in that first round. Dropped him again. He dropped Josh Koulibau two times in the first round early. Then Koulibau seemed to, I don't know, seemed to wake him up, honestly. He seemed to put himself together a little bit. Seemed to get himself back into that fight. But in my opinion, that first round was done. That was decided. You got dropped twice in the first round, dude. Unless you do some dropping of your own, that's it. You can't you can't get that round back just by marching forward and bombing. Then when the second, the third round, somewhat similar, some decent back and forth. The second was close. The third was a very clear Danny Silva round to me. That third round, Danny Silva came forward. The third round, Danny Silva had some takedowns, had some control. Had Josh Koulibau dropped again, but instead of hitting his head, this time I think he blasted his leg or Josh like screwed his ankle up or something to that effect. Either way, it was clear Danny Silva won the first round and the third round. The second one was close-ish. Fine. And what was the decision? A split. I don't think that was a split decision. I think it was pretty clear that Danny Silva won. And I think what ends up happening is people see a close fight. And they say, oh, that's a split decision. But that's not how fights are scored. Fights are scored by round. So in order for a decision to be split, 
one of the three judges has to score the majority of the rounds for somebody else. So if a round is close, if every single round is razor thin, then yeah, you're going to get a split decision. People are seeing it, different angles, different views. Yeah, I think this happened. I think that happened. But I don't think we had close rounds. The only round that was close was the second. The first was a clear Danny Silva. The third was a clear Danny Silva. So even though this was a competitive fight, and even though Josh Koulibau had some success or wasn't a complete mauling, I don't see it as a split decision. I don't see how you give Josh two of the three rounds. So I know a lot of people were complaining about the decision, and there's three decisions on this card people are complaining about. I do think they got this one right. But Sal Diamato specifically got this one wrong. He's the one who gave two rounds to Josh Koulibau. But either way, the takeaway is Josh Koulibau is tough as shit. He'll take his beating. He'll stay in the fight. He'll be in your face. Danny Silva needs to work on striking defense. He basically gets hit with anything that gets thrown in his way. Anything that gets thrown at him hits him in the face. But he pressures forward. He's tough as hell. And he did show some very solid fight IQ. Him to work in some takedowns. To get the body lock, get control, do that. That is solid fight IQ. Good for Danny Silva. UFC debut. Got it done as a plus 170 dog. And now we need to ask ourselves, how good is Joffo Filio? And I'm going to continue to say Filio, even though it's Fijo, Philho. Joffo Filo. Filo. I, either way, how good is he? Because my breakdown here was I did pick him to win. And I essentially said, yes, we saw Asu Almabayev in his last fight take down Ode and submit Ode. But Joffel's not as good as Asu is, even though he is very good. He's not as good as Asu. And I give Ode a lot of credit. He's a tried and true veteran. He's a very good striker. He's a good fighter. And he's definitely fought the higher level of competition. And I don't think I gave Ode too much credit. I don't think I gave Joffel enough credit. So while I picked him to win, I didn't think he would win this quickly and this dominantly. There was almost no striking to talk about. Joffel bombed, got a very nice takedown, like a very nice takedown, and then immediately climbed, worked, and got the submission. Joffel Filio, now back-to-back first-round submissions, this time over an actual UFC vet. Joffel Filio might be very good. He almost beat Muhammad Makayev. If you remember, he had Muhammad in that knee bar where his knee was not bending in the direction a knee is supposed to bend. So Joffo Filio might be very good and might be somebody that we should talk about. And unfortunately for Joffo Filio, he just got passed up for a title shot. He didn't have enough fights in the UFC and nobody would have ever considered him for a title shot. But they just announced Steve Ursa getting a title shot. And if Joffo started it a year earlier or this fight had just happened... The division is such a hot garbage mess right now with injuries and people who just fought and everybody's beating everybody. The division's a mess. And all of a sudden you get some stability with somebody like Joffel. He could try to make something happen in this division. I think he is very good. I do want to see him fight somebody who can defend the takedowns. Once we see that and he wins that fight, then we'll know specifically how good he is. But right now, all we have to work with is what we've seen and what we've seen is very good. And at what point does skill matter? And that was the premise of jujitsu. I don't know if you know this. If if you're a newer MMA fan, right? If you showed up during COVID, that's great. Welcome. Like, I don't care if you just started watching fights last week. The more people that watch fights, the bigger the sports get, the bigger the sport gets, the better it is for all of us, right? We want this to be a giant sport. I don't want to be the only guy in my neighborhood that watches fights. I want everybody to watch fights so I can talk to them about it. Not just the big fights, but all of them. So if you're new to MMA, welcome. Let me give you a little history lesson. The UFC started as a literal advertisement for Gracie Jiu-Jitsu. The Gracies came to America from Brazil, were teaching Jiu-Jitsu. They were running Jiu-Jitsu gyms. And they said, we need to expose Jiu-Jitsu to the world. And this was in the 90s when like karate was the biggest thing. Every corner had a karate studio. Every kid did karate. And we saw all those karate movies, like The Karate Kid, all the Chuck Norris movies, like all of those movies. The karate was the biggest thing in the world. And jiu-jitsu, the Gracie family said, I'm going somewhere with this and it will tie back to this fight, I promise. And the Gracie family said, we need to show the world that jiu-jitsu is the best. How do we do that? And they said, who's the scrawniest, most worthless looking dork we have in this family? And that was Hoist Gracie. 
So they took his scrawny little ass and they started the ultimate fighting championship. And they reached out to all the different gyms and said, bring your biggest, baddest son of a bitch and they're going to fight in a cage and we're going to see who the best is. We're going to see what the best style is. Give me a boxer. Give me a wrestler. Give me every freak, animal, savage, bar brawler, tank abbot, son of a bitch that you have and I will show you that this scrawny dweeb will win on technique alone. And that's what happened. That's what happened. Hoist Gracie submitted everybody for the first couple of UFCs. And then the sport evolved. People were like, well, I have to learn how to not get choked with my own pajamas. And then the sport evolved. But it was always, size doesn't matter. Who cares how big you are? Look what Hoist Gracie just did to a sumo wrestler. Nobody cares. It doesn't matter. And that's not an exaggeration. They literally had sumo wrestlers fighting normal-sized human beings and the sumo wrestlers weren't winning. But now size does matter. And this was a perfect, perfect envision of that or encapsulating of that. We have the Jolly Green Giant. And I picked her to win. I picked Chelsea Chandler to win. But she came forward slow as shit no technique whatsoever, and just jolly green gianted her way to a win. And again, I picked her to win. I wish I bet on her. I didn't. So while I am not shocked by the outcome, I am shocked at just how disgustingly slow and poor techniqued and just lack of fight away. Like, she's tough. Everybody who steps in that cage is tough, even though we say otherwise to some of them. So she's tough. She took her beating. Look at her nose. But I would love somebody to point out what actual technique was used in this fight. She literally pushed a much smaller human being against the fence, squeezed her real hard to the ground, and then laid on top. And I've wrestled my whole life, so don't tell me there was a takedown in there. I've wrestled my entire life. I didn't see one official takedown. I saw squeezing and and dragging. But holy shit, is Chelsea Chandler bad? Holy shit, is Chelsea Chandler bad? At least Josiah Nunes came forward bombing, trying to make something happen. Chelsea Chandler's terrible. All she has is size. But you know who did use a ton of technique? Mike Davis. Mike Davis looked spectacular. When he became a minus 500 favorite, I was like, damn, dude. Natan is really tough. Minus 500 is a lot of money to spend on a guy that's been gone for a year against somebody that's tough and good, like Natan Levy. I mean, he could have been a minus 1,000 favorite. He had the most complete performance of the night. His striking was on point when he was striking. His takedowns, the wrestling, on point. The grappling exchanges, crazy. He dominated every single grappling exchange except one. Natan Levy had one nice sweep. One nice sweep, a nice little explosion on bottom, a nice sweep, ended up behind Mike Davis for about a half a second, and that was the end of that. I mean, Mike Davis looked good, dude. He looked very good. We just need him to be more active. He had a year off from his last fight to this one. He had a year off between the one before that and his last one, and then a year off between the one before that and the one before that. Constantly taking a year off between fights. Eventually, he's going to miss his like window of peak physical, I should be fighting, right? The, the 27 to 32, right? That's probably the window for most fighters. And he's going to miss that if he keeps taking a year off, a year off, a year off. But either way, Mike Davis looked incredible in this fight. And I want to see him fight in the next couple of months. And I just want, just keep throwing him back out there. Let's see how good he is. Because this is some very exciting fresh blood. We knew he was a good striker. We knew he was a good wrestler. Now we know he's a phenomenal grappler. I was shocked at how smooth and clean his actual jujitsu was. Mike Davis was worth far more than the minus 500 odds he closed at. And obviously much better than the minus, what, 250 he was just one week ago. And speaking of good wrestling, we had some phenomenal wrestling out of Gerald Mearshart. Gerald Mearshart's wrestling looked great. That was always the knock on him, right? Like, he could be a decent striker. It's not great, but he's got some technique in there. Obviously, we knew his jiu-jitsu was great, but his wrestling always needed a little work. He had a, a low 27%, I believe, is the number. If I got that number exactly correct, the brain on me. I believe a 27% takedown accuracy. 
out of Jeremy Oshard historically. But he looked good here. He had a couple of incredibly well-timed takedowns. He literally, oh, Brian Barberina is about the bar brawl. Duck, boom, double. Duck, boom, double. Not cage takedowns. Not trips. Straight up clean Jordan Burroughs double. My head is in the middle and I'm going to run right through you. And he looked great. The takedowns now complete Gerald's game. I have always said in this era of MMA, you obviously need to be well-versed in all the things. Striking, I'm just going to limit it to three. Striking, grappling, and wrestling. You need to know all the things. It's not 1996 anymore. We don't have a skinny dweeb wearing a bathrobe submitting giants. Everybody knows everything now. But you can be successful by being very good at two of those things. If you're a very good striker and a very good grappler, you can get away with not having good wrestling because you can win on your feet or on the ground. If you're a very good wrestler and then a good striker, it's fine. Use your wrestling to stand up. That's what Chuck Liddell did. Chuck Liddell built an entire career on being good at two things. I'm holding up two like this. I'll do like this for regular people. And now Jared Mearshart is good at two things. Now he has wrestling and grappling. His striking is always just decent. The problem is he has no chin, so he can't be striking too long. And he, I think he got dropped. I'll have to watch that again to see if it was a trip, but he got sat down, just boop, boop, boop. And then he continued to fight from there. I think it was closer to a trip than anything, but the reality is his chin is not good enough for him to be focusing on his striking and staying up for longer. But now that he's got well-timed blast doubles up the middle, well, Jared Mearshart's officially good at two things and can make something happen. Brian Barbaran, that's probably it for him, right? They're probably going to cut him. He's uh, a fun guy to watch. He always comes out. He always brings a fight. But And I'm, I'm not trying to whatever, but like, look at this picture. Look at his body. Look a little soft, right? He's not a 185-pounder. He's a 150-pounder if he took his career very seriously. And I'm not joking. So he never took his career fully seriously. He's now on, I believe, a four-fight skid, at least a three-fight skid. But it does sound like he's set himself up for the next stage of his life. It sounds like he has a, not a whiskey company, but a, um, what do they say? What do ladies drink? What is that alcohol that ladies drink? It wasn't rum. A rum company. He opened a gym. So he's setting him up himself up for the next stage of his life he has a knockout win over an all-time great in Robbie Lawler he can run his gym off of that he built a nice little career for himself but it's just pretty obvious he hasn't been taking it too seriously recently so he's probably cut and good for Gerald Mearshart took it seriously came out here made some changes shot some beautiful takedowns and then got it done and that takes us to what quite possibly could be one of the worst decisions we have ever seen and give me a second before you start commenting because you're a C-Rod fan and just start and throwing up on your keyboard and saying angry shit. Just let me get there. Before this fight, I think the worst decision I had ever seen in my entire life, and if you've been watching this sport for as long as I have, you should remember this fight. It was Michael Bisping versus Matt Hamill. Matt Hamill is the deaf wrestler. He's the guy that technically has a win over John Jones, right? John Jones landed some illegal elbows and then got DQ'd. That's Matt Hamill. Matt Hamill beat the shit out of Michael Bisping. Took him down whenever he wanted to, was winning the strike. He beat the shit out of him. But it was in England, and he lost a decision. That quite literally was the worst decision I, I personally had ever seen, or at least one that has just burned into my brain as a terrible, terrible decision. And now we have this decision. I'm going to walk you through, again, before you angrily defend Christian Rodriguez like he's your cousin, give me a second. Isaac Dolgarian, let me recap the fight, and then I have some statistics here for you. I will show you. Isaac Dolgarian came out, dominated the first round, dominated. You could argue the first round was a 10-8. What you're looking at here right now with Isaac basically in full mount on top this was literally the first two rounds of the fight. He had nine plus minutes of control time in two rounds. Dominated the first two rounds. There was almost no strikes thrown whatsoever. He immediately got it to the ground, just ragdolling, tossing him wherever, taking his back, almost choked him out three or four times with different submissions. Dominated the first round, wasn't even close. Second round, dominated as well. He absolutely, Isaac Dolgarian absolutely slowed down and got tired towards the end of that round. Without question. Without question. 
he got tired and slowed down towards the end of that round. But he won that round. And then the third round, Isaac Delgarian looked pathetic. He looked pathetic. He looked absolutely pathetic. Crawling around on the ground, covering his head, begging not to get knocked out. Looked pathetic. But he knew he was up two rounds, potentially with a 10-8 in the first, and all he had to do was survive. And that's exactly what he did. So let's look at the rounds. Let's look at what happened in each round. You heard my narrative. A dominant first round, a mostly dominant second round, and then an embarrassing third round, okay? Here's the first round. Four minutes and 48 seconds of control time, which means he controlled all but 12 seconds of that first round, right? Nobody's arguing this round. Literally one single significant strike landed by Christian Rodriguez. The rest of this was takedowns. Three for three, a whole bunch of control time, a whole bunch of strikes. Just beat his ass. Got it. Nobody's arguing the first round. The second round, actually, we'll skip. The third round, similar story, but in reverse. Isaac Delgarian, zero for seven in takedown attempts. Pathetic. Christian Rodriguez gets plenty of control time over three minutes. It's not the 448 that we got from Isaac in the first round, but it was plenty of control. Like Christian Rodriguez dominated that round. You could say 10-8 if you'd like. Then we have the second round. Let's work our way across. We're going to start from the right and work our way left. Control time, four minutes and 11 seconds in a five-minute fight, which means there was only 49 seconds, only 49 seconds of this round where Isaac Dolgarian was not in control. That's what control means, who is controlling the position. So for 49 seconds, only 49 seconds, Isaac was not in control. For the other four minutes and 11 seconds, Isaac was in control. He went four for six on takedowns. You'll notice zero knockdowns. There was no wobblings. There was no knockdowns. There was no meaningful strikes. And you could say, well, Christian Rodriguez outstruck him. It was 18 to 15. Christian Rodriguez landed 18 strikes. Isaac Delgarian landed 15 strikes. I mean, I'm pausing for dramatics. Christian Rodriguez landed 18 strikes. Isaac Dolgarian landed 15 strikes, had four takedowns, and four minutes and 11 seconds of control time in the second round. And two judges watched that and said, yep, great round, Christian. Oh, great round. Sal Diamato watched that and said, hey, the, the 49 seconds... The 49 seconds where Isaac was not in control, Christian looked so good, he made up for the four minutes and 11 seconds where he was. Ron McCarthy said, you know what? I loved those extra three strikes. The extra three strikes that Christian Rodriguez landed were so impactful that I had to give him the round. It's absurd. Like, it's absurd. And honestly, you, you can, somebody's still going to leave the cope, some dumb shit like that. I'm literally looking at this objectively. I did not have a bet on this fight. I could care less. If Christian Rodriguez was going to win, I would have preferred he won by finish. So this isn't even a conversation. I hate that this is a conversation. It's bad for the sport that this is a conversation. Because you know what happens? We start to see all the cut rigged, rigged. UFC's not worth watching anymore. UFC sucks. It was their job. Rigged. You can't trust them. Corrupt judges. And if that's the narrative, that's bad. I don't think it's rigged. I think people are just idiots. You live in this world, right? I live in this world. You've been to the grocery store. You look around. Everybody's an idiot. There's idiots everywhere. They walk among us. Most people are idiots. Think about everybody you know. Most of them are idiots. And unfortunately, some of them are MMA judges. They're idiots. I don't think there's corruption. There's not a bigger picture here. We just have idiots doing jobs that idiots shouldn't be doing. You know who wouldn't have effed this round up? Chris Lieben. Chris Lieben is a former UFC fighter. Great, Chris the Crippler Lieben, ton of fun to watch. Was he the best? No. Was he exciting? Yes. He's now a judge in Nevada. He judged some of the fights tonight. If he was judging this fight, I promise you he wouldn't have messed this up. I promise you he wouldn't have messed this up. But Sal Diamato, 198 years old, 
actually don't think he's that old, but Sal Diamato, when your reputation is like a fact that you are always on the wrong side of bad decisions, maybe, maybe a review. I've got a real job. YouTube isn't my real job. If I sucked so bad at my real job that everybody in that company knew, oh, anytime a deal goes south, it's an Angelo deal. At the very least, I get a warning. The very least, let alone probably fired. And I'm not making this out to be bigger than it is. I just think that was a terrible decision. I don't know how you can see somebody get absolutely dominated for four minutes and 11 seconds and then still give them the round. That made no sense. I'm not arguing the last round. 10-8, no problem. If you gave the first round a 10-8, I'm no, I have no problem with the last round being a 10-8. At worst, this should have been a draw. So I'm not saying Isaac Delgarian won this fight because I think it was a draw. I think it was a 10-8, 10-9, and then a 10-8. Isaac should have won a decision, but if you want to say a draw, I'll take a draw. I'll take a draw. That's worst case scenario. Let me know in the comments what you think. I am very curious. Don't be like some weirdo Christian Rodriguez uh, faithful. Be normal. Be objective. I am curious what normal people think. And then this was just the cherry on top. At this point, I wanted the whole card to burn. Burn it to the ground. My safety parlay broke. Burn this whole thing to the ground. I didn't need Kennedy winning or losing didn't matter to me at this point. The only thing at this point of the night the feature fight that the only thing that mattered at this point of the night was I needed Brian Battle to win to be up money. We'll talk about that next. So at this point, I was like, burn this shit to the ground. Ovin St. Pru, let him win this fight. F let him win by decision and really just absolutely blow everything up for everybody in this world. And that unfortunately is what happened. That does suck. I'm being sarcastic. I'm not rooting for everything to just absolutely fail. But that's basically what happened. Ovin St. Pru winning a decision pretty much solidified the fact that nobody was going to make any money. And obviously, I'm going to get the whole button. I made money. And obviously, of course, people are going to make money. There's 13 fights, which means there's 26 fighters to bet on and hundreds of different prop bets. So obviously, some people made some money. And congratulations to you because this card was a freaking minefield. This is me dodging mines. But Ovin St. Pru didn't look horrible. I mean, he looked old and slow, but he looked like a tough man, a man. Man is key word here because Kenny and Chuck will look like a boy. Just a uh, little shot here, little shot there. I'm not going to do enough. I'm afraid to throw. I'm a minus 600 favorite and I'm not going to try to win this fight. Uh, uh, uh. I'm nine feet tall. I can fight you from the other side of the cage. Uh, uh, uh. Doesn't throw. Kenny and Chuck will sucks. No, that's what I wrote in my notes. Sucks refuses to engage. It's just, just sloppy chaotic it just it doesn't make any sense because there are moments where Kevin and Chuckle looks incredible and we always knew Ovin St. Prue was an insanely talented guy nobody denied that that's how I broke down his fight Ovin St. Prue is an incredibly talented guy that ruined his career by going up in weight and taking short notice fights and that is what happened he would go to heavyweight be a mess he would take a fight on a week's notice be a mess but Hanging out, light heavyweight. Yeah, he was slow. He's old. He's 40. But he still moved forward, still landed meaningful shots, still made it happen. Good for Ovin St. Prue. Good for you. And Kennedy deserved to lose that fight the way that he fought. And what a mess that guy is. Talk about a mess. We had a co-main event have a no contest. And it's not the UFC's fault. This isn't a conspiracy. It was an eye poke. Then it was an accidental eye poke, and the fight didn't go long enough to go to the judges' scorecards, and then Angelosa took his opportunity to bail on that fight. This is a picture of Brian Battle screaming into the microphone, just yelling, I was beating your ass, I was beating that guy's ass. He wanted his way out, he took his way out. The best thing that Brian Battle said in this, so if you didn't see the fight, Brian Battle was piecing up Angelosa. It wasn't even a close, it was not a close fight. Brian Battle looked... A, humongous. B, was marching him down, landing whatever strikes he wanted to land, just doing whatever he wanted to do to Angelosa. Ange had a speed advantage, but it didn't matter because he was backing up and not landing anything. Shot a couple of half-assed takedown attempts. Brian Battle stopped him. No problem. So Brian Battle was objectively winning this fight. Looked great doing it. Without question. Without question. And as I mentioned, 
if Brian Battle won this fight. That is the difference between making me, me making money and losing money. And it wasn't a huge difference, but I was either going to make 20 bucks or lose 60. I ended up losing 60 because this was a no contest. So they just, you know, that, that bet, the odds changed and it became a whole thing. Either way, point being here that Brian Battle was dominating this fight. And if the accidental no contest happened later in the third round, they would have gone to the judges, they would have scored it, and then Brian would have won. The problem is it happened early. There wasn't enough fight to score. So they're given Ange time to check his eye, and they oh, I can't see. I can't, I can't see. So they waved the fight off. He can't see. He said he can't see. Fight's over. He took his way out. Because immediately after, Brian Battle said, I was beating your ass. And Ange was like, oh, no, oh, no, let's go, let's go. I'm going to kill you. And the best thing Brian Battle said on the microphone was, 30 seconds ago, they canceled the fight because you said you couldn't fight, and now you're trying to fight me? Now you want to fight? And he's 100% correct. You want to be a tough guy now when the fight's canceled? And it's canceled because you couldn't fight me. So how are you going to pretend that you're going to fight me right now in this cage when you literally, 30 seconds ago, literally refused to fight me because you, you can't see? Brian Battle was going to beat his ass. Uh, Angelosa, if he couldn't see, he couldn't see. We've seen eye injuries before. Here's another throwback reference for people who have been around for as long as I have. I don't know why I'm saying this aggressively. Vitor Belfort won, won the UFC light heavyweight championship with just a, ch a short hook punch. The stowing, the stitch on the outside of the glove. Okay, so the glove is like leather on bottom, leather on top. It's pinched together and there's just little stitches on the outside. That sliced Randy Couture's eye, just like ever so sliced right across his eyeball. That's an eye injury. This was a poke. And the main event, I, I finally picked the main event correctly. I think I had lost three in a row, something like that. I finally picked the main event correctly, and this is how I thought it was going to go. I thought Marcin Tybora would weather an early storm, get Ty Tuivasa against the cage, get him to the ground, and that's it. As soon as Ty got taken down, he literally flopped like thunk, just flopped flat back on the floor, and then that was the end. Like, you knew he wasn't going anywhere from there. You just knew he wasn't going to go. And it sucks because I love Ty Tuivas. Who doesn't? Who doesn't like Ty Tuivas is great. He's a ton of fun. He's exciting to watch. He's got a great personality. He's got plenty of knock. Like, everything about him is fantastic. But you put him up against a guy that can take him down, and this is what's going to happen. You put him up against the guy that's got the power of Sergei Pavlovic. This is what's going to happen. I don't know who they're going to give him next, but let's hope they don't give him like a Sergei Spivak or somebody like that who's going to take him down. Just give him some other heavyweight that'll stand there and trade with him that doesn't have the power that he has. Give him Josh Parisian. Give him Josh. Let him beat Josh Parisian. We love this guy. Let him get a win or let him at least put him in a situation where he can win. Because fighters, some fighters need to play their role. And officially at this point, Tai Tuivasa's role is be the Cowboy Cerrone. Your title challenging days are behind you. It's, it's evident you're not going to fight for a title. And that's okay. Not every single person on this roster needs to be queued up for a title shot. So let's give Tai Tuivasa the fun, exciting fights. Let's give him people that will hang out with him and he could do a shooey and knock him out and do all. Give him those people and let's just have some fun with this division. They're heavyweights for Christ's sake. They're heavyweights. So it sucks that Tai went out this way. I don't think it affects his stock very much. Like, again, he wasn't fighting for a title. People love this guy no matter what. He got taken down, he got submitted. It is what it is. Now, if he got cracked with a jab and knocked out cold, well, then that's a problem because now who the hell is he going to fight next? Because then that's it. But that is not what happened. Good for Marcin Tybora. If he didn't just get smoked by Tom Aspinall, then, oh, let's see who he's going to fight next. This should be interesting. But he did. Tom is the current champion, so that loss has a little more weight than it did just a few months ago. But, you know, I'm curious to see what happens with Marcin Tybora. I'm curious to see how far he goes. But I think he's going to be... Always the bridesmaid, never the bride. I think he's always going to be good enough to beat, what, 7 through 15, but not be able to beat any of the top five people. And unfortunately, that means he's not going to fight for a title. And then even more, unfortunately, he's not Tai Tuivasa. Tai Tuivasa's got tons of personality, can sell merch. People love that guy. Put him on a card anywhere near his hemisphere, and he'll do sales. He'll do tickets. He'll make some money. Marcin Tybora is just going to grind, 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 and then eventually 
that'll be it for him. Guys, that was the card. It was a dumpster fire. There were some moments of excitement, but it was a mess. Let me know your thoughts on this card. All the picks and the bets for UFC Vegas 89 are already up. So go check those out. Unlock them at wewantpicks.com. Click become a member at the top. It's only $10 a month. You will get the safety parlay. It did miss tonight. But you zoom out a little bit. I hit 11 of the last 14. I hit two last week at UFC 299. Overall, in the last almost two years that it has existed, it hits at a 70% event rate, a 28% lifetime return on investment. The safety parlay is still a good long-term bet. I believe in it. I believe in it. You can unlock the safety parlay. You can unlock the tools like the line movement tracker, the tools like the detailed data metrics and analytics and everything else at wewantpicks.com. Just click become a member. It's only $10 a month and we are less than a month away from UFC 300. So this $10 will get you not only UFC Vegas 89, but also UFC Atlantic City and UFC Vegas 90 and then UFC 300. Wewantpicks.com. Click become a member at the top.